Hello, Ajahn. Hello, everyone. Hi. Okay, let's pay respect to Ajahn. Okay, so I guess we can just start. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, just I was told that yesterday there was a question after the uh, death meditation, death contemplation, about uh, someone who was saying that um, after they, when they did that, they felt so alone because you have to give up all your family and friends and everything. You felt so alone and you felt so alone that you just wanted to die. <laughs> and uh, which is a good comment. So thank you very much for bringing these things up because these are important little things to kind of to clarify on the way. Yeah. And one of the important points about the Dhamma, whatever practice that we do, whether it's a death contemplation, or it is a anapanasati, or it is a metta contemplation, or even if it's just, uh, you know, keeping virtue in daily life, or whatever it is that we do, generosity, everything has to be done with wisdom. Uh, we have to be smart, we have to be clever about how we do these things, uh, and not just do things in a kind of, um, oh yeah, the Buddha said so, so I will just do it blindly, but we have to see how these things actually affect us. Uh, this is such an important point, and it's often forgotten in meditation circles to tell people and to remind them to be wise and to be circumspect, uh, to look after themselves, uh, to make sure they don't just follow a guideline without seeing how it affects them. Uh, so all of these uh, teachings, they are supposed to give rise to something positive, yeah, something wholesome. Uh, and uh, in the death contemplation, the purpose of that contemplation is to help with the idea of abandoning things, giving things up, uh, or being secluded from all the worldly phenomena. That is the point, yeah? The point is to kind of feel free, to feel liberated from those things. Uh, you can, uh, the idea is to see the burden of those things. In, yeah, see the burden of these things in your life, yeah? And then as you see the burden of these things in it, you know, if you do it in the right way, the sense of losing your identity should be liberating. It should actually feel really light and bright as a consequence. And that is the idea behind this. But not everybody is able to do that. It's obvious, yeah, it all depends on where we are on this path. So ask yourself how it affects you. And if it affects you in a negative way, you feel maybe sad and depressed and suicidal. No, this is terrible, don't wanna carry on anymore. Then don't do it or do it in a gentle way, do it in a more preliminary way, yeah? And then gradually kind of move up to doing this in a deeper sense. So be smart about these things. Everything should have a positive outcome. Huh? Everything should lead you on the path to more peace and happiness and joy, huh? should lead you away from suffering and problems. Huh? And if it doesn't do that, then uh, you have to uh, you know, uh, look at what you're doing wrong and see if you can do it in a better way. But please keep in mind that the death contemplation is a very important part of the spiritual life. Yeah, the Buddha specifically says this is something that everybody should do, whether you are a monastic or a lay person. Yeah, it doesn't matter, monastics and lay people. And of course, whether you are a man or woman doesn't make any difference at all. That's all the same. So this is something for everybody. And that is because it is a very powerful reminder of what matters in life, what is really important, yeah? At the end of the day, what you are gonna take with you from this life, it is a reminder of that. So it's a very useful thing. It puts things in perspective. It allows you to see what actually, what, where your values should be placed in this life, what is truly valuable and what is much less valuable. Of course, our things in the world still have value, but they don't, uh, they're in a different way from the profound values uh, that you have in, uh, you know, uh, in spiritual matters. Uh, so um, um, just, um, uh, so that is uh, the importance 
of this and the importance of uh, uh, the death contemplation, be wise about it. One of the important and significant points I wanted to make about the death contemplation is that it is very uh, similar. The idea of dying is very similar to what we are doing in meditation practice. Uh, yeah, it's a similar kind of process that you go through. It's a process of giving up, of letting go of the world around us. Uh, and this is why the two fit very well together. They almost kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, the same kind of thing. So if you are able to use that death contemplation in the right way, it means it's actually an aid to the meditation. And one of the beautiful things about the death contemplation is that when you are on your deathbed, you're not going to be striving very hard. You're not going to be striving to let go. You're not going to be striving to... Uh, watch the breath or whatever, it's going to be very natural. Yeah, you're just going to be really relaxed. You're going to be at ease. You're just going to say, okay, now is the time to let go. Now is the time to relax, not to strive. That's what happens when you are, you are on your deathbed, especially if you have lived well. But that too is the way meditation should really happen. Yeah, by being relaxed, by being at ease. So there are multiple ways in which the death contemplation, the idea of being on your deathbed, uh, is actually very similar to what happens in meditation when the meditation goes well. When the meditation goes right, uh, there's so much in common between these two things. Uh. So this is why I try to kind of use that. But be gentle with yourself. Know your limits. Know what works. Uh, don't push yourself too much, otherwise you're going to suffer. And that is not the point at all of this Buddhist path. Okay, so I hope that helps to clarify things a little bit for you. And um, so let's um, come back to some of the uh, uh, remaining suttas that we have to uh, still haven't done. And I think we should be able to uh, do all the suttas at this time. Usually I don't get it quite right as one sutta too much or one sutta too little or whatever, but this time it seems to be just right. Yeah, so I don't know uh, how this happened, but this is good. And the next sutta is a well-known sutta called the Baddhika Ratta Sutta, uh, translated here by Ajahn Sujato as one fine night. Yeah, thank you for bringing it up. Uh, that's, that's marvelous. And uh, one fine night, Bad Eka Ratta Sutta. And this sutta is said to be, uh, if you like, one of the fundamental suttas uh, of the spiritual life, one of those basic ideas uh, that we should all grasp, yeah, to understand how to live the spiritual life. Uh, so this is a very fundamental way of thinking about this life. But it is about meditation practice, yeah, and this is why it is interesting here. So if you Think back of what we have done so far. We have done a lot about right view, and we have also talked about virtue and the importance of virtue. That was part of the Kalama Sutta and also part of some of the other things. Uh, we have talked about, uh, uh, yesterday, we talked about the idea of uh, uh, not working the mind up through desires and ill will to keep an even mind, uh, an equanimity, and upeka in the mind. Uh, talked about that yesterday. And the next step on the path is Samma Sati, yeah, the right mindfulness, and also the Samma Samadhi, the, medit the uh, deep stillness in meditation. So now we're moving into that meditation territory. Yeah? There is a system in my madness. It may seem like a mad collection of suttas, but there is some little bit of system there. Yeah? So uh, don't uh, despair if you can't see my system because it's a bit, little bit random, but there is uh, some underlying purpose to this. So. So one fine night, and this is how this uh, sutta goes. And it starts with, so I have heard. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove, another Pindaka's monastery. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants. <laughs> Sounds a bit funny when you say mendicants, but it means like monastics, yeah? It means people who live on alms food. That's the literal meaning of that, uh, people who live on alms food. Uh, it's an old-fashioned English word, but it fits very well with the idea of bhikkhu and bhikkhuni. It means almost exactly the same as bhikkhu and bhikkhuni, which also, also means an alms, uh, an alms gatherer, yeah, or an alms mendicant or whatever. Uh, Venerable Sir, they replied, uh, and the Buddha said this, uh, 
I shall teach you the passage for recitation and the analysis of one fine night. Listen and pay close attention. I will speak. It's beautiful how the Buddha often says this, listen and, and pay close attention. I will speak. Yeah, I am going to give you a message of significance. Try to understand this. Pay close attention to what I'm saying. This is going to be for your benefit, yeah, if you can understand this. So uh, Buddha often says this when he uh, starts out the sutta on his own. He hasn't been asked the question. He says, listen, I will speak, yeah, yeah? and everyone, whoa, okay, be quiet. Listen to what's going on there. Yes, sir, they replied, and the Buddha said this. Don't run back to the past. Don't hope for the future. What's past is left behind. The future has not arrived. And phenomena in the present are clearly seen in every case. Knowing this, foster it, unfaltering, unshakable. Today is the day to keenly work. Who knows, tomorrow death may come. For there is no bargain to be struck with death and his mighty hordes. The peaceful sage explained it's those who keenly meditate like this, tireless all night and day, who truly have that one fine night. Beautiful, isn't it? It's really kind of inspiring and it's, uh, and it's also quite profound. It's interesting. There's a lot of important points there yeah, in this little uh, thing here. And if we go to the top, the first verse again, and uh, uh, it starts off by saying, don't run back to the past. Don't hope for the future. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, so this is, you know, how common it is that we dwell in the past, and you can see that very clearly in your meditation. One of the great things about meditation is that you learn to understand yourself. Yeah, you see how your mind operates. And in the ordinary life, when we run around and we do our shopping and we look after our apartment, we do our duties or whatever it is, we are so busy. It is actually very difficult to have that self-knowledge and really understand how you work and where your mind tends to hang out and what your mind tends to do. But when you come to a little bit of a retreat, when you start to calm down a little bit uh, and you step back from those ordinary worldly things, uh, then you start to see yourself much more clearly. Uh. And one of the things that you will see is that the mind very often goes into the past thinking about, oh, no, this happened, or they did this to me, or I shouldn't have done that, or, Ooh. or maybe you kind of, you are uh, thinking about something nice that happened in the past, or, or whatever it is, we tend to hang out in the past a lot. Uh. Or, the alternative is that we look into the future. Yeah, we think, oh, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? This bloom and retreat, we don't get any good food here. I want to make my own food, which is much better. Or you think about all the entertainment you're going to enjoy when you go back home. Or you think about the problems that you have to resolve at work or in your family. Yeah, all of these things are about the future. All this kind of little bit of anxiety or a little bit about hope for the future, what we want to do. So much about life is like that. So we have to learn to let go of these things if we are going to be mindful. Yeah, Mindfulness is about being present, being aware of what's happening now, not being in the future, not being in the past. So this matters enormously, this ability to do that. And some of you who may have read Ajahn Brahm's little booklet, you may remember his booklet, the um, basic method of meditation that he wrote about 25, 25 years ago, something is a long time ago now. And in that book, he talks about the future and the past as two heavy suitcases, yeah, that we always carry with us. These oh, suitcases always coming with us. Uh, and how the idea is to let go of those heavy burdens, put them down, uh, and then rest in the present moment. The present moment is restful, yeah? There's no anxiety in the present moment. Uh, you just are aware of what's happening. Uh, there's no worry about anything. Uh, you just chill in the present moment, uh, and you have a good time. Uh. So this really matters enormously. Uh. But how do we let go of those heavy suitcases? Uh? This is kind of the, you know, the million-dollar question, yeah? 
not million, not a million Sing dollars, a million US dollars. Yeah, this is a really important question. So <laughs> why? Certainly not million dollar, million ringgits. That's even that's even less. Yeah. So this is really this is the real kind of uh, maybe billion dollar question. I don't know. All of these things are so important. How do we do these things? It's easy to say we should let go of the past and the future, but how is it actually done? And it is actually quite simple. And these are the things that I have talked about already a lot during this retreat. And to let go of the past, well, what is it that normally bothers about us about the past? Well, a lot of the time it is about what happened with a certain person. They didn't say the right thing. They didn't do the right thing. Yeah. Or maybe we didn't do the right thing. Yeah, and we feel a bit bad about that. And maybe, oh, maybe I should apologize. Or maybe, you know, I shouldn't have said that or whatever. Yeah. All of these things, it often has to do with... Uh, our you know, feelings of maybe ill will or with guilt or with feeling bad about something in the past. So a lot of those problems about the past can be overcome by forgiving the past, letting go of the past. This is such an important thing to be able to do that. How do you forgive the past? And the way you forgive the past is to again, to know that nobody really in this world wants to do what they are doing. We are all slaves to our habits, slaves to our conditioning. Yeah, yeah? We're all trapped in our personalities, trapped in the ways we have done things in the past. Uh, and nobody really understands what they're doing. Yeah, We're all kind of blind and deluded in what we're doing in the world. Uh, how can you blame a blind person for doing stupid things? Uh, how can you blame a deluded and ignorant person for misbehaving? They don't know what they're doing. Uh, so instead of that, we forgive them. Okay, you treated me badly. It's okay, I understand. You are a human being. You don't know what you're doing here. I forgive you. And then you do the same for yourself. You also understand your own limits. Yeah? It often feels like we have so much power to do the right thing in this life. But actually, when the more you look at yourself, the more you look at who you are as a person, the more you understand that you too are trapped in your personality here. You too are trapped in your conditioning, whatever that is. So you learn to forgive yourself, yeah? And you rejoice in your good qualities. You rejoice in the good qualities of others. And then you forgive the negative qualities. And if you can do that, wow, you're gonna have such a good life. Yeah, it's gonna be so marvelous because all the problems with other people will largely disappear and you will be so much freer as a person. So the idea of forgiving is the way to let go of the past. And the way to forgive is to understand this non-self idea that we don't know what we are doing. There's no one in charge, yeah? Everyone is just messing around, trying to fumble their way through life, trying to find the right path. We don't know what we're doing here. And if we could be kind all the time, we would be kind all the time, right? Wouldn't you be kind all the time if you could? Wouldn't you always treat other people well if you were had the ability to do that? I think everybody wants to be kind all the time because we know that kindness is good for us and good for others. We know it's such a positive force in the world. And we can see what happens when we have leaders who are not kind, which we happens sometimes in the world as well. And so we know the power of these things. And yet, even though we know we should do it, we are not able to do it. Why? Because we are trapped because we are held in by our past habits. That is the reason, that's the only reason. Otherwise, you would, we will always be kind, always treating other people well. And uh, you know, I sometimes, I'm, I marvel, I look at myself and I've been a monk now for 25 years or whatever. Yeah, so just starting out, yeah, Ajahn Brahma has been a monk for 46 years, something like that. So I often marvel at how incredibly strong these habits are. You know, when I kind of get upset about something now, I think, gee, I've been a monk for 25 years. It was taking a long time to get over these habits. I'm much better than I used to be, but still these kind of things, they linger in there. So you keep on at it, keep on at it, knowing that if you do it in the right way, if you follow the word of the Buddha, you will overcome these things eventually. It is not that hard to do because it is fairly obvious once you understand what it is, but you have to apply yourself daily, all the time, then you will overcome these bad habits. So that is mostly about the past, yeah? And the future is, uh, in some ways, 
um, more difficult to let go of, yeah? Because the future has a lot to do with our attachments, the things that we have in the world, uh, the, you know, our relationships with other people, the things we own in the world, uh, what we're going to do in the future, how we're going to solve our problems and all of these kind of things. Uh, so that is more difficult to let go of. Uh, but uh, remember, the way to let, the, one way that I use to let go of this uh, is to tell myself that I have no future. Yeah, I have no future. I have no future. Oh, okay, okay, no point in going there if I have no future. So why is it that I have no future? Well, the reason is because I could die now. I could die tomorrow. And if I die, you know, now, I hope I don't die now. I, I want to finish this talk at least first. <laughs> but maybe, I'm not sure if that will happen. Maybe I won't be able to finish this talk. So if I'm going to die any time, well, then the future is so incredibly uncertain it is as if I don't really have a future at all. And remember that you are still going to be planning your future on the day you die. You will still be living in the future, even though it's completely ridiculous because there is no future, you are still going to be planning it on the day you die because that's how we function as human beings unless you are very spiritually developed and you have good meditation, all of these kind of things. So you let all of that be. The future is too uncertain. I don't know about any of this. I may never be around for these things. And anyway, it's actually not that interesting. Why? Because the happiness of meditation, the happiness of peace is far more attractive, far more stable, far more interesting, far more everything than anything in this world, which is so utterly unreliable. And this is one of those great things that I mentioned before about having some difficulties sometimes, yeah, like the COVID situation or whatever. It reminds you of the problems in the world and it helps you therefore to let go and move across to the spiritual realm instead because that is where you will find something more stable, something more lasting because it has to do with your inner qualities uh, rather than the very unstable, uncertain, unreliable outer world around us. Uh. So this is how you gradually learn to give up the future and the past, yeah? See it as burdens, understand that it does, it's never going to give any uh, real satisfaction anyway. You may solve one problem, there's always another problem behind. In fact, the problems in samsara are endless. So all you do when you uh, resolve one problem is you are hastening the arrival of the next problem. Uh, yeah, as soon as you solve one, the next one is waiting behind, bang, it hits you, and then you have to solve more problems. So, so sometimes, much better to put it off. Do only what you have to do. Don't overdo uh, the things in this world. So these are some uh, guidance. And here again, you can see how the death uh, idea can help you to overcome uh, attachment to the future or hankering for the future or uh, thinking about the future in any, any way. So don't run back to the past. Don't hope for the future. The past is left behind. We forgive all of that. And the future has not arrived. In other words, we have no idea what's going to happen in the future. We may not be around. Forget about it. Let it all go. Now is the time to be mindful instead. That's the first verse. The second verse has about that the phenomena in the present are clearly seen in every case. Yeah, so this uh, clearly seen is the word uh, vipassati. I don't know if you know the word vipassati. The word vipassati is the uh, ver verbal form of the word vipassana. Vipassana is the noun, yeah, which means like clear seeing. And uh, this is the verb. It means to, to see clearly. Yeah, that's what it means. Uh, so this is about vipassana, basically. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, whatever, uh, whatever is the present phenomenon or phenomena, you see those things clearly, yeah, here and there, tata, tata. So patrupanadama means in, uh, things in the present moment, yeah? So that is what you see. You have given up the future and the past, so what you see is the present moment, and you are therefore mindful, yeah? You see what is happening here and now, uh, and you see it clearly. You have this vipassati, yeah? And it says here and there, in other words, in all areas of life, you have this clear seeing. Yeah. So why, why do we have this clear seeing? What is the point of this mindfulness? And I want to just uh, very briefly talk a little bit about the point of mindfulness. 
Have you ever considered that before? What the point of mindfulness is? And um, one of the things that I have always often felt was lacking in some of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, you can go on a meditation retreat and they will tell you, you should be mindful all the time, yeah, throughout the day. You should know all your postures, you should know what is happening in your mind. Uh, and uh, so this idea of mindfulness, but they don't often tell you exactly why. It's as if mindfulness is going to be good regardless. Yeah, it's always going to be good. So don't worry about why, just be mindful. Uh, this is very often a very common idea. So everyone tries very hard to be mindful. But why exactly should we be mindful? Uh, what is the purpose of this? Uh, yeah, an important point, right? Uh, so this is the answer. The, the uh, purpose of mindfulness depends on where you are on the path. Uh, yeah, so very early on in the path, like when we start out, when we're trying to keep the five precepts, yeah, we're trying to keep the five precepts, not to lie, not to do any of these bad things. And we're trying to maybe be kind to others and maybe act with generosity towards our spiritual companions and all of these kind of things. So initially, the purpose of mindfulness is simply to enable us to do these things, to be aware, make us aware of what we are doing. Yeah. And you will know, all of you will already know that this already can actually be quite hard. It can be hard because sometimes we speak so fast, yeah? Words just come out of our mouth before we even have time to think about it. So even this can be quite difficult. It takes some training to have enough mindfulness to be aware of our speech and even of our actions. So this is the first reason to be mindful. Yeah, so in daily life, in whatever you do, having the ability to regulate yourself. You know, if some of you have done some of these uh, mindfulness courses that you hear about, mindfulness-based stress reduction, M MBSR, these kind of things, uh, a lot of that has to do with the ability, in part, to just be aware and relax, and also to regulate your emotions a little bit, uh, so that you don't get carried away by the stream of thinking and emotions so strongly. Uh, and um, uh, so and that, that is all very useful, but I, I think in the, on the Buddhist path, uh, it is perhaps even more clearly defined in a certain way. In the beginning, it is just about being able to be live well with the people around you. Huh? So this is the beginning yeah, of mindfulness. Huh? And then as you develop these things, as you develop the path, the second level of mindfulness there isn't really any level. Yeah, it's just a kind of a scale. Things just change, but I'd call it a second level if you like. The second level is not just to be moral, but also to think in the right way. Yeah, to be able to regulate your mind. And this takes more mindfulness. And it is more difficult in ordinary life. It is easier on a retreat, but more hard in life when you have to be around people a lot. But to actually know what you are thinking here to know whether anger is about to arise, yeah? especially anger and ill will. This is the most important thing yeah? to be able to get a handle on it. So mindfulness tells you whether you are about to get angry, then you can take a strategy to avoid that anger. Yeah? And that strategy should not be to suppress it. Yeah? The strategy rather should be to use wisdom and to think, what's the point of getting angry? This is really silly. The other person is just doing what they're doing. They don't really know what's going on anyway. I forgive them, let go, bang, anger is gone. Uh, and you have compassion for them instead. Something like that. There's some wise reflection that stops that anger from arising here. So this is the second way of using mindfulness. So use that mindfulness to reduce the defilements of the mind, especially the anger and ill will. Sensual desire, much more difficult to reduce. And it does, it's not so important, yeah? I, of course, if it, has, if it is very strong and very excessive, it can make you break the precepts and do bad things. But uh, generally speaking, anger is far more blameworthy than uh, sensual desire or attachment to the sensory world. So I usually recommend people to focus on that. Uh, and the results of focusing on anger are so much more powerful. Yeah, you really feel that you are getting somewhere and doing something very positive for yourself when you're reducing this. Uh, so this is the purpose of mindfulness, yeah? And in this way, you also learn to regulate your emotions because you don't get carried away by these things so strongly because of mindfulness. And then once that uh, uh, kind of restraining faculty is 
established to some extent, where you don't have these strong emotions anymore, you have more of a, a balanced mind, that is when meditation can happen. And this is the next level of mindfulness, yeah, where you can meditate because you have such clarity. Yeah? So you are mindful, you are aware, you are in the present moment, and because of that, you are able to watch the breath, yeah, or you are able just to enjoy being peaceful or whatever it is. Why? Because your mind is not so distracted by the past and future anymore. You have that mindfulness there, and then you can stay with the breath. And then, of course, that takes you on this amazing journey of meditation, which actually promises this incredible results if you get it right. Yeah, and if you haven't experienced any of these results yet of meditation practice, it is only a matter of time if you keep on practicing this path in the right way. Everyone can experience these things. But this path is like magic. Yeah, this path gives things that are really completely out of the ordinary, out of the ordinary world. And this is what is so inspiring and so magnificent about this Buddhist path. It gives you access to this incredibly uh, meaningful and powerful states uh, that you will never ever forget in your entire life uh, if you have a glimpse of these things. Uh, these are literally life-changing events. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself, so that is coming later on. So you clearly see, this is what vipassana means in the suttas, vipassana clear seeing, yeah? This is to me one of the main things just being able to know what's going on and then taking the remedial action. Not just being aware as we are sometimes used to, but being aware in the sense that we use our mind in a good way here. Yeah. And then knowing this, yeah, knowing, seeing clearly, in other words, we should develop that, foster it. And what does that mean to foster it and develop it? It means we take it to the point when the mind is unfaltering, unshakable. Yeah? Yeah, because, and the reason why we want to take it to that point is that we want to take the clear seeing to the deepest aspects of the Dhamma, to the deepest aspects of our mind. And this is where this, we're on this treasure hunt, yeah? We're looking for the treasure of the Dhamma, the jewel at the heart of the lotus. This is the treasure hunt we are on. And what we're looking for is something that is so profound, so beautiful, so powerful, so liberating so much so that it ends all suffering and brings the highest happiness possible. But because it is so profound, we need a very powerful mind to be able to deal with it. And that is why the mind has to be unshakable and unfaltering here. And when we talk about the unshakable and unfaltering mind, we're talking about the mind that comes out of a deep state of samadhi. In particular, we are talking about the mind that comes out of a fourth jhana experience. But if it isn't the fourth jhana, it is a lesser jhana experience, yeah? It is something powerful and profound. And that is where uh, the mind becomes really unshakable and unfaltering. And that is where we have the ability to uncover the deepest treasures in life, the deepest meaning, uh, and what this existence really is all about. Uh. So you can see here how the path is kind of outlined yeah, in this little verse. Uh, give up the past and the future, allows you to be mindful. If you have strong mindfulness, it allows you to meditate and go deep, which then uh, ultimately leads to the very deep kind of samadhi, which then uncovers the nature of existence and give you the most profound insight that is possible as a human being. Yeah. So it is all there, in a sense. So it's, um, I don't know, if it's not so... It's not going to be easy for you to see all of those things in those little in the, those little verses because you are not used to reading the suttas. Yeah, when I see a Pali word, I know straight away what it refers to. I know how it hangs together with the other suttas, so I can kind of show that it has a more meaning than it might seem. Yeah, so this is why why I'm here. So hopefully you you know you are gaining something from this, be able to see things in a deeper way. Yeah. Anyway. Then the Buddha says, today, today is the day to keenly work. Who knows, tomorrow may bring death. For there is no bargain to be struck with death and his mighty hordes. Yeah, and again, this is the death contemplation coming in again. A reminder that we just don't know how li long life is going to last. Yeah, we always think that it's going to be sometime in the future, the uh, death. But actually, it's very hard to know sometimes how far away it is. 
and it brings a sense of clarity, it brings a sense of sanity to our lives. Uh, yeah, where we really start to prioritize things in the right way. We prioritize the spiritual values, kindness, care, compassion, all of these kind of things to everyone in our life, to our family members, uh, to our work companions, uh, to people in our Buddhist community, uh, to the Christians, to the Muslims, to whoever it is. We're kind and caring to everyone in the whole world uh, because we start to understand the human condition. Uh, and we know now is the time to do these things. Uh, yeah, you cannot strike a bargain with death. Yeah, when death comes, uh, death comes, and there's nothing much to do about it. Uh. The peaceful say, this is the Santo Muni, uh, this, this is the Buddha, explained it is those who keenly meditate like this. Uh, yeah, this is the way to do it. Uh, tireless all night and day, who truly have that one fine night or day. Maybe day, have one fine day, yeah? Because you are now meditating by day, so it has to be by one fine day. In fact, the Pali word is uh, ratta, and ratta is like the same way we use day. We say one day, we mean 24 hours. Uh, in ancient India, they said ratta. Ratta was a period of 24 hours. So actually, you can translate it as one fine day if you want to. Uh, and maybe that is uh, just as good. Uh. So... There you are. That is the Bad Eka Ratta verses. Not the whole sutta, but the verses of that sutta. And if you wish to read the whole sutta, please do so. This is found in the middle length sayings of the Buddha, Majjhima Nikaya, number 131, sutta 131. And you should be able to find that yourself on the internet or whatever. And just type in MN131 and you should be able to find it. And then you can have a look at it. Make sure you get the good translator, yeah? Not some dodgy translator. There are lots of dodgy translators out there. Make sure you look for the good ones. Someone like uh, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi or uh, Bhante Sujato has a new translation now, which is uh, also very nice and very simple. Uh, and, uh, you know, and of course, if I have done the translation, I would really recommend my translations. They are really top notch. Anyway, that's what I think. Other people might not agree, but that's what I, I tend to think, yeah. So, um, let us move on to the next little sutta, which is just reinforcing what we have just seen now. And this little sutta is uh, uh, from the uh, Sangyutta Nikaya. And this is called, so it's called the wilderness. And uh, uh, so again, from the Devata Sangyutta. And basically, it's just more of the same we've just been talking about, but it kind of presents it from a slightly different angle here. They do not sorrow over the past. They do not hanker or desire for the future. They maintain themselves with what is present. Hence, their complexion is so serene. <laughs> through hankering for the future, through sorrowing over the past, Fools dry up and wither away uh, like a green reed cut down. Uh, gee. Okay. So there you are. So if you, you, you maintain yourself with, in the present, yeah, and if you do that, your complexion is serene. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's kind of a vanno. Vanno here is a, the Pali word vanno means like beauty or complexion. Yeah, your color or beauty. And that color and beauty is uh, uh, tranquilized or it is serene. This is the Pali word. Pasidati means to become serene. So it's kind of a, it's less like, like a bribe for meditation practice. Yeah, it is a bribing you. It tells you you become more beautiful if you meditate. <laughs> so that's kind of a, Nice, yeah, so if you want to become more beautiful, then you can meditate, but please don't meditate for the outer beauty, meditate for the inner beauty. It's the inner beauty that matters in life. The external stuff is so, is so temporary, yeah, it's so, it so lasts only a short while, and then before you know it, you get old and gray and everything kind of starts to fall apart, and then you die, and a corpse is not exactly very beautiful. So it is the inner beauty we should strive for. But if you want external beauty, it says here, uh, uh, letting go of being mindful is good for that too. Huh? And then it says, and it's a beautiful little phrasing here, yeah, that through hankering for the future, huh, through so for longing for the future, 
through sorrowing over the past, the fools dry up and wither away like a green reed cut down. Yeah, and all of this sorrowing over the past or, hang, or longing for the future, it just makes us uh, wither away. It makes us become old. It makes us kind of, uh, because we are so worried about things and always concerned about things, uh, not really enjoying the present moment. Uh, so it is a bad idea to do this. Uh, and if we let go of all of that, then instead we start to live uh, wisely here. Yeah. So I don't really want to say much more about that. So I'm going to move straight on to the next sutta. So can we please have the next sutta? And uh, this is one of my uh, favorite suttas. I have left it for last because this particular sutta, it talks about the uh, progress of meditation, how meditation happens, uh, and especially what happens during the more deeper stages of meditation and how we take this all the way to the end of the path. Yeah, this is what this is about. Uh, so it's a very beautiful sutta, in my opinion, for many, many reasons. And one of the reasons why I like it uh, is that it is very similar in some ways to the way that Ajahn Brahm teaches meditation. Yeah, and because Ajahn Brahm is my uh, teacher, super duper teacher, uh, because of that, I, I really like it when the suttas say pretty much exactly what he is saying. Yeah. So I will read it out for you, first of all, the whole sutta, and then I will discuss some of these aspects in here as we go along here. Yeah. And many of you will have heard me teach this many times before because I always like, I often like to teach this. So um, uh, this is how it goes. This is from the AN, which is the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses. Uh, uh, the 11th, the 11th is the book number 11, yeah, it has 11 chapters. Uh, and this is the second sutta called uh, Volition, or Volition, you can call it will, if you like, or Adan Sujato has translated with, with making a wish. Um, and so this is, uh, uh, this is this particular sutta. So this is what the Buddha says, bhikkhus, uh, yeah, or mendicants, if you like, yeah. For a virtuous person, one whose behavior is virtuous, no will need be exerted. Let non regret arise in me. It is natural that non regret arises in one who is virtuous, one whose behavior is virtuous. For one without regret, no will need to be exerted. Let joy arise in me. It is natural that joy arises in one without regret. For one who is joyful, no volition or no will need be exerted. Let rapture, yeah, even more happiness, arise in me. It is natural that rapture arises in one who is joyful. For one with a rapturous mind, no will need be exerted. Let my body become tranquil. It is natural that the body of one with a rapturous mind is tranquil. For one tranquil in body, no will need be exerted. Let me feel pleasure. It is natural that one tranquil in body feels pleasure. For one feeling pleasure, no will need be exerted. Let my mind be stilled, concentrated, immersed, stilled, whatever you prefer. It is natural that the mind of one feeling pleasure is stilled. For one who is stilled, no will need be exerted. Let me know and see things according to reality. It is natural that one who is stilled knows and sees things according to reality. And it goes on from there, it con continues on from there, all the way to the final liberation. But I have cut those out because I don't think we need to go all the way to the end. And then uh, the Buddha says, yeah, after having gone all the way to the end, he says, thus bhikkhus, thus mendicants, thus uh, lay women and lay men, everyone, uh, one stage flows into the next stage. One stage fills up the next stage. For going from the near shore to the far shore. So this shows you how liberation happens. 
It shows you how meditation develops when meditation develops right. Yeah, you go through all of these stages. This is how ideally you should experience meditation. Yeah. And isn't it marvelous? Yeah, if you look at that sequence there, the idea of meditation practice on the Buddhist point of view, the emphasis on joy, on happiness, yeah, on rapture, on gladness is just so central to this whole path. There is no real Buddhist meditation without that joy. Isn't that a wonderful message? Isn't that kind of, it is so mind-bogglingly beautiful that this is what the path is all about, more and more joy. And this is the kind of joy you don't normally experience in ordinary life. Sometimes you can feel a bit joyful in ordinary life, but this is like multiplying the joy a thousandfold, yeah, making it more and more powerful. And in fact, this is one of the two, um, one of the two ways of knowing that your meditation is going right. There's two factors, if you like, in meditation uh, that is always increasing as your meditation is going deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and those two things, those two aspects of meditation that are always going deeper is on the one hand, the joy and happiness that you have. Uh, yeah, you feel more and more happy and joyful. And on the other hand, the tranquility, the peace that you have. Uh, you know that you are on the right track if you are feeling more and more peaceful and you're feeling more and more joyous, more and more happy. These are the two qualities. Yeah, so as you move along, these are the two things that should be improving in your meditation practice. And this is exactly what you see here. This is exactly what you see in the Anapana Sati Sutta, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing. This is a standard thing you see throughout the suttas with all meditation practice. There is no real deep meditation without that profound tranquility and joy and happiness on the path. So it's so powerful. Yeah, this is what we are all doing here. This is what you're heading towards. Yeah, this is what we're supposed to happen here. And then it eventually takes you all the way to liberation, all the way to the very end of the path. Wow. And uh, now the very important question is, this is a very, this is kind of the really significant one. Yeah. Why is it not happening to me here? Or why isn't it, if you have, or if it's happening a little bit, why isn't it going all the way here? What is the reason here? So before I say anything about that, I want to make a very important point that this sutta is making here. You will notice that the sutta says every, for every verse, it says that no will need be exerted. Yeah? No will need be exerted here. Volition is just another word for will. Actually, it is not a good translation. I don't like that translation. I, and I noticed to my horror, this is a Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. I noticed to my horror that Ajahn Sujato has translated in the same way. You don't need to make a wish. Yeah? You don't need to make a will. And um, it's not actually accurate to the Pali. The Pali says, uh, na chetanaya karaniya. It literally means this cannot be done by willing. This cannot be done through an act of will. That is actually what it says, which is a much stronger statement than saying the will is not required. Yeah, you cannot do this by willing. That's not how it works. Why is that? Because it says in the sutta, it is natural. These are natural phenomena. They arise through causes and conditions, not through our willing. So if they are natural phenomena, and we try to will them into existence, we are actually getting in the way because we have to allow nature to take its course. So the will is actually problematic. The will actually blocks us from achieving these things. So if it is natural, if all of these things arise as a natural consequence, one after the other, why is it that we don't, why is it that we aren't enlightened already? Yeah? How come we haven't gone all the way to the end if these things arise naturally? That is the question that is so important here, that really matters. And the answer to that question is that we have to go back to the very first factor of the sequence. If each of these stages are natural, if each of them happen as a consequence of the previous one, then it is the first one that really matters. It is the first one that will give us the key, yeah, the key to how to unlock this entire sequence and to make it start, to make it going. And what does the very first factor say? The very first factor says that for a virtuous person, 
for one whose behavior is virtuous. Yeah? It is only for that person that this sequence starts. That is how we know that this sequence actually takes off so for a virtuous person. So if the sequence isn't happening to you, it means that there is something in your virtue that you can improve even more. And maybe you think, oh, but I'm, I'm living really well. Yeah, I'm living on the five precepts. I'm trying to do all the nice things and living my life in a positive way. What do you mean I have to be more virtuous? And remember that the idea of virtue in Buddhism or of morality or of a lifestyle is actually a very profound idea. It is not just you know, a simple idea of keeping the five precepts or anything like that. If you want to purify your virtue, it is very, uh, there's so many factors to it. And this is really where the path is made or the path is not made on our ability to purify the virtue. So if you are not making as much progress as you think you are, look at your virtue. Look at what you can do better. Okay, how, is, how are my actions? How is my speech? Yeah. How do I think? Do I have anger? And if I have a lot of anger, then maybe I should reduce it. Do I have a lot of attachment? It was very fascinating, this question we had about this person who said he felt so lonely or she felt so lonely during the death contemplation because suddenly, uh, yeah, suddenly you are alone when you're dying. Yeah, this is the insight that comes from that. Uh, and that is a very important point when you do these contemplations. It gives you an insight about your attachments. Uh, so that is the beautiful insight for you right there that you know where your attachments are. Yeah? You are attached to the people of your life uh, and without them you feel alone. Uh, and that tells you that you need to develop yourself in the spiritual life to overcome some of that attachment so you can die peacefully in the future. That is what that tells you into some extent. Yeah, so um, uh, we also use our minds to overcome some of those attachments as well. Yeah, some of these things that bind us to this existence. And uh, that happens automatically as you develop the path. And then you ask yourself the positive things. Uh, not only is virtue about not doing the bad things, it's also about doing the good things. Uh, can I be more kind in the way I treat other people? Uh, can I use more kind speech? Uh, yeah, remember every time you open your mouth, you have the ability to give someone a gift, uh, a gift of kindness, uh, yeah, to say that you appreciate them, to say, uh, thank you to say something nice that goes to people's heart. Yeah, use gentle speech in the way you speak. All of these things. Uh, it's an endless gift-giving opportunity. Our faculty of speech. And then also, how do you think about the people around you? Do you generally have loving kindness for people? Uh, do you have a sense of compassion for people when you see that they suffer and you see the problems in life? Yeah, all of these things are the things you have to develop. This is what it means to develop your virtue to a very high level. And when your virtue is really, really pure, yeah, sometimes you meet in life these incredibly good hearted people who have so much metta and kindness and compassion. They radiate this kindness. And if they really have that, they can go into meditation so easily because of that. Yeah. And this is what this is about. Then this whole process happens. So that is the critical thing for meditation to work. Then meditation starts, and then you go into this beautiful process uh, that the Buddha is talking about here. Yeah, this great, marvelous process uh, of going through one happiness after the other, deeper and deeper. Uh, and with that happiness comes the tranquility, comes the peace of the mind, the peace and the joy deepening and deepening as you go down, uh, becoming more and more profound. Uh, until eventually the bliss and the peace are so powerful. Uh, they are so attractive. Uh, your mind gets drawn in. And when your mind gets drawn in, uh, that is when you attain a deep state of samadhi for the first time. Uh, and at this point, uh, at this point, you have reached full satisfaction. Uh, there's nothing missing in your life anymore. Uh, there's a feeling of everything being complete. Uh, you are completely blissed out. Uh, there is no desire for anything in the future. Uh, everything is completely peaceful. Uh, and because of that, there's nowhere to go anymore. Uh, you have found the meaning of life. There's no further need for anything else. Uh, you are absolutely content and happy. Uh, 
absolute contentment means there's nowhere else to go. It means you have found meaning here. You have found the, what existence and life is all about. And this is what you find through this path. And uh, the strange thing, that is not the end of it, because you may find that meaning of life through the deep stages of meditation, but then you have to come out again afterwards. And that coming out again afterwards, that gives you the possibility of seeing things in accordance with the reality. Yatabhuta Nanadasana is the Pali word. Yatabhuta, according to reality, or, or uh, yeah, according to reality. And Nanadasana, vision and knowledge, knowledge and seeing according to reality. And that is where you gain that profound insight. Uh, and you can make that uh, sense of meaning, having found the final meaning, the final purpose of existence, uh, you can make that permanent, not only an arbitrary meditation, but a real final permanent solution to all of these uh, problems and all of these things that we have. Uh. So this is this beautiful path. And I think it is really worthwhile uh, talking about the uh, beauty of Buddhism and the beauty of this teaching from this point of view. Uh, so often Buddhism is regarded as pessimistic, but not at all. Buddhism is this, uh, ex has it gives this extraordinary gift to anyone who practices it properly here. The gift of all of these most wonderful feelings, most wonderful experiences uh, that is possible to have as a human being. Yeah? So, uh, there you are. That is the last sutta that I have on this retreat. And I hope you have enjoyed these suttas. I don't know, maybe some of you think, oh, this is, oh, this is difficult. Or some of you think, well, this is, I don't know, I'm not so sure about this. And I know that some of you will have really enjoyed it. So it, it probably varies a little bit. But if you have enjoyed it, one of my jobs, I feel, as a Buddhist monk is to guide people to the word of the Buddha, because the word of the Buddha is just so powerful and so beautiful. And so, I don't know, it is so attractive. It draws you into these teachings and it makes you, uh, you know, want to practice all of these things in a very powerful way. So um, this is the beauty of these uh, things. Yeah. So if it does attract you in this way, then please, please, please uh, go and read those suttas for yourself. And, uh, and uh, uh, then when you do that, uh, you will actually start to gain even more from these particular suttas. So this is my encouragement to you. And then you will make this teaching your own, uh, these beautiful teachings of the Buddha. Um, okay, that's all I have for now. I saw that there was someone wanted to ask a question there. Please, if you can bring up that question again. Uh, this is just a thank you. Uh, this can, that's a marvelous uh, a thing to hear. A thank you. But there was someone who had a question there, I think. Would you like to bring that question up again? And I will see if I can answer that question now, because it is the last day. So I'm quite happy to take a few questions, if you wish. Uh, directly send it to you. You have to open it yourself. Okay, can I please ask a question? Read death and revelation. I felt fine with giving up. Or, or it was only a partial question. So where do I... Where do I have to open it? And the you click on the chat. chat. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Okay, now this is better. Let me come a little bit closer. I'm a little bit far away, so I can't really see properly. Come a bit closer to the screen. Um, okay. I felt fine with giving up all the other things, but emotional when I let go of family and friends. Can you please help to explain a bit? Uh, uh, yes, because our attachments to our family and friends are going to be very strong, yeah? This is just the way things are with um, family and friends. And uh, so uh, you learn, and this is kind of, you know, death is a reality. Death is something that we all have to go through. It is impossible to avoid death. And because of that, we kind of need to be able to deal with these things, yeah? We need to kind of feel right now, how can we let go of these things? Otherwise, it will all happen when you die. And then it will be really hard to, deal with it on your deathbed. It's too late to really deal with it then. So this has given you some marvelous insight into yourself. Yeah, the fact that you can, um, you understand now that you have some attachment to your family and friends. Of course you do. Every, most people have some attachment, 
But through practicing the Noble Eightfold Path in Buddhism, you can reduce that attachment. You can become more independent as a person. And this is what this really is about. Uh, building up that sense of independence in yourself. Uh, and being independent is a marvelous thing in life. It is always bad to be dependent on others uh, because dependence on others means that other people can manipulate us. It means that we will be sad when people die and get sick and all of these kind of things. Uh, so independence is only a positive thing here. Uh, it does not mean that you become hard or cold or anything like that. In fact, it gives you more metta, more compassion, because it gives you more ability to see things clearly. So it is only positive to have more independence. Um, okay, so which is the next one? Okay, thank you, Adan, for the few days of very delightful teachings. You have explained everything in a very practical way. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, dear Adank, thank you for your precious time and sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, so is it more important to develop wholesome qualities and trying to reduce ill will rather than observing more precepts? Uh, who are more about reducing sense pleasures? Thank you. It uh, depends, yeah, it, it, uh, it really depends what you are, where you are on the path. And uh, the point, of course, is that uh, uh, if you are starting out on the path, then first of all, we should focus on the basic things. Yeah? Starting with the more basic things like the uh, redu you know, developing good qualities and also keeping the basic precepts, the five precepts, and also reducing ill will. That You can do all of that. But uh, there comes a point when you also want to restrain and you want to give up a little bit. Yeah? It is important to do that as well. And so keeping the eight precepts, uh, you know, especially when you go on retreat or that sort of thing, it can be very useful because it shows you whether you are able to give up that sensual world without suffering too much. Sometimes, you know, many of you have probably been here to Jana Grove. Actually, this is not Jana Grove here, but just next door to the monastery. And you will have a feeling for what it is like to go on a eight precept retreat. Yeah, and you will know what happens to your mind. And some people are able to deal with it very well, but there are always, uh, you know, also t times of the day when you will fantasize about food. Yeah, <laughs> I think everyone does that, except if you have been a monk like me for 25 years, you almost never think about food anymore because you're so used to the routine of not eating in the afternoon. But for, you know, I feel sometimes I feel sorry for lay people. Yeah, I feel cheapest. You have coming from lives when you're used to eating in the afternoon and suddenly you have to give it up. Actually, it is quite a hard ask, yeah? So, but that gives you that insight into your attachment to the sensory world and whether you're able to give it up or not. And that can be very useful. So do practice these precepts occasionally to test yourself, yeah? And you will know uh, your depth of your meditation and your depth of understanding on the Buddhist path. Yeah? Thank you so much, Adan, with much gratitude. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That's very kind of you. Hi, Ajahn. May I know why I felt extreme pain in my head and feels very weird after coming out of the death meditation? Um, okay, so I can, I can only guess that you were forcing things too much. It was natural. You were probably trying to control your mind in a certain way. And when we try to control the mind, then usually it ends up with some very negative consequences. Yeah. So please don't try to control your mind. This is one of the critical things to be able to really relax and sit back and really enjoy yourself. It really matters so enormously. So maybe it means that you are not ready. Yeah. Maybe it means that you should not try to do the death contemplation. Or if you do the death contemplation, just do it a little bit more in daily life to remind yourself that you're going to die. And for that reason, now is the time to be kind. Now is the time to live well. Tomorrow, it might be too late. OK, next question. Enduring an austere lifestyle prior to achieving high levels of samadhi, can we lay people who are so used to the comforts of modern life achieve such high levels of practice as well? Yes, you can. Yeah, it is not impossible. In fact, there are lay people who do this all the time. 
maybe not regularly, but certainly uh, occasionally. And you can, and the reason why you can is because you go to a place, to a meditation retreat center, and you give up that uh, sense pleasures of the world temporarily for a short time. Yeah, that is what you do. And that is why you can do it. But to be able to do that, you have to uh, practice well in daily life. Yeah, you have to really focus on the aspect of kindness and these kind of things. And if you focus on that consistently over long periods of time, year after year, yeah, and in a deep way, looking into your mind, looking into yourself, being brutally honest with your weaknesses, what are my weaknesses, overcoming those weaknesses, then you will be able to get there. But it can take, it takes a lot of commitment, yeah, a lot of endurance. Some people have that success fairly quickly, maybe because they have developed their mind in a past life. But for others, it can take a lifetime of commitment to get to these things. So it really depends on all kinds of things. Uh, okay. Hi, Venerable. I felt breathless during the death contemplation meditation. So I started to think of the Buddha inside my heart. Is this okay? It is absolutely okay. Please think about the Buddha inside your heart. If you find that it is difficult, uh, not working out, again, don't do things if it is uh, not working out for you, then it is not doing the job it is supposed to be doing, which should be to make you peaceful, happy, letting go, giving rise to something positive. Okay, uh, next question. I will just go for a few more questions, a few more minutes. Thank you enormously for the teachings. I enjoyed it. I realized that I still regret about things that I have done years ago to save my relationship just as I thought I have let go. Would I even be able to get over it? Thank you. Uh, the answer is yes, guaranteed you will be able to get over it. You have to let go, you have to forgive, you have to remember that uh, we human beings, we often don't really know what we are doing. We are trying our best, we're fumbling around in the dark. That means you and also the person in your relationship, yeah? all trying our best, not really knowing what we're doing. So always forgive, yeah? Always forgive the blindness in other people who are trying, but sometimes making mistakes, sometimes causing suffering for ourselves and others. The answer is always to forgive, because uh, really, we are just fumbling around in the dark. So keep on practicing and you will get there. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, if we should not think of the future, then how should we think of our work, which requires planning and maybe craving to ensure that the work grows? Okay, you should think about your work at the right time. Yeah, and uh, the problem is not that we think of our work. The problem is that we think about our work obsessively. That is the problem. We don't have any control over the thinking. Yeah? So you want to think about the work when it is the right time and not when it is the wrong time. Yeah? And if you are not able to stop thinking about your work in your meditation, it means that you are obsessive about it. You're not really uh, in charge of your mind. That's what it means. Uh, so think at the right time, not at the wrong time. Here we are talking about meditation practice. That is the wrong time to think about it. Uh, so there is a difference here between being in control of your mind and not being in control of your mind. Uh, if you are in control of your mind, it means that you think about those things when you want to think about them, not as a kind of uh, machine or uh, running in the background, always thinking about things, uh, because that is what your mind does uh, as a habit. Hello, this is a question. Oh, I think you went down too far. Uh, um, let's have a look. Yeah, this is a question to Ajahn Brahmali. If we can, if you can pass on, I appreciate. Okay, here I am. So it's passed on. Dear Ajahn, I was surprisingly touching and deep experience to do death contemplation. Okay, marvelous. But I was surprised after we have died, we still have consciousness, like when we are in deep meditation. Thank you so much <laughs> from Min. Yes, exactly. This is the point. Yeah, you are still there. There isn't really much difference between being alive and being dead. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. You kind of carry on. Okay, you 
don't have access to this world, but you are still there. Your mind is still there. Yeah, you are just carrying on into the future and then eventually you get reborn. And that is why you can remember your past lives and you can see this was me in the past life because of that continuity. Yeah, so that is a nice point. Ajahn, thank you for your wonderful sutta sharings. Very inspiring. Any tips of sticking to a daily meditation? Any tips? Okay. Uh, um, enjoy your meditation. Make it uh, the, the sort of length that you enjoy. Don't try to push it too much. Find a nice place to meditate, a place where you are, can kind of be uh, where you sit every time, a place where you are not really uh, reminded of you know, too many of the things in your life. You can kind of close your eyes and leave everything out. Do it at the time when you feel fairly strong mindfulness, fairly awake. Normally, I would recommend people to do it in the morning because in the morning you are, uh, you know, you are usually quite fresh. Don't do it straight away. Get up have something to drink maybe, walk around a little bit, give yourself half an hour to wake up or something, then do you know, 20 minutes of meditation or whatever it is. Find an app or find a guided meditation to help you so that it gets you into the mood of meditation. Yeah, it can be difficult, especially when you live in a city like many of you do, to get into the mood because the, uh, the feeling has to be right for the meditation to work, right? So use a meditation app or use a, maybe even some calming noise, yeah? Some calming kind of meditation sound to kind of, especially in the beginning, to help you calm down. Or listen to Ajahn Brahm. If the voice of Ajahn Brahm makes you feel uh, calm, listen to Ajahn Brahm, uh, all of these kind of things. And uh, so, and then test yourself and then see how it, how it uh, you know, how it goes. If sometimes don't feel, you know, the necessity to always stick to your commitment, uh, there may be times when you feel really out of it, you had a really bad night's sleep for whatever, whatever reason, and you uh, wake up and you're really exhausted when you wake up, that may be the wrong time to meditate because maybe you are not ready for it. Uh, uh, you know, sleep in a little bit extra instead or whatever. Uh, so don't feel absolute obligation to do it every day. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, you can do things in this, in this way. Huh? And um, I know I, I was very surprised. I, I, I spoke to my brother recently and he told me that he has starting to meditate every day. Yeah. <laughs> it shows you the influence. If you have a brother who is a Buddhist monk, it really influences you. Yeah? you. You kind of go down the same path, whether you want to or not. Huh? And so he started to meditate every day. And he says the, the reason why it, the reason he's able to do that is because he has a meditation app. He uses a meditation app by uh, Sam Harris. That's the one that he was using. But there's lots of meditation apps out there. And he gets up before everyone else in his family. So he has the morning by himself and he can just enjoy the morning and do whatever he likes. So that was what he told me. Huh? Okay. Uh, next one. Thank you for the amazing Sudha teaching. Wonderful. Sadhu Sadhu. That's marvelous to, of you to say that. Huh? And I'm very glad that you enjoyed it. Uh, next one. Thank you, Ajahn, for your clear explanation uh, of the suttas. Uh, may you be well, happy, healthy, and safe always. Okay. Thank you so much for all your kind messages. Uh, Hi, Ajahn. Piti Sukha was strong in the beginning, but thoughts and sloth and torpor came in as the meditation progressed. Uh, how do I overcome this? Uh, thank you, Ajahn. So... Um, uh, I, this is just, you have lost your inspiration uh, there somewhere. And what you should do is you should ask yourself uh, how the Piti Sukha arose initially. And very often you will have the Piti Sukha, maybe because you were inspired by the suttas or inspired by the Buddha, or because you had some kind thought towards yourself or a sense of compassion for your friends, yeah, there, or whatever it is. There's something that, that gives rise to that Piti Sukha. So ask yourself what that is. Go back to that, yeah, and lift it up again. Then go to the breath and bring that Piti Sukha with you onto the breath. See your breath in a positive way and then develop it further. Yeah, so it is often, it is often just um, understanding how the mind works. And as you do that, you can develop these things more efficiently, more systematically. Yeah. 
Um, thank you, Ajahn Brahmali. The joy referred to in the last sutta, is it something that is ordinarily present in one's daily life as well? Lots of gratitude. It uh, depends. Yeah, it can be. Sometimes you can have joy in your daily life. Sometimes it can just be you feel just really joyful. You feel, wow, what a wonderful day today. The sun is shining. You know, everyone is friendly today. You know what it's like when you wake up on a really good day and you feel you have met that for the whole world. Everyone seems so wonderful. That is the kind of joy is possible to have during daily life. And of course, if you are a very highly developed person, you will feel that joy also during daily life. Yeah, because that's just part and parcel of developing this path. But I think for most people, they will not have that joy all that often. You have it sometimes, but not all the time. Uh, but uh, it's certainly possible to have it during daily life. Uh. Okay, so uh, next question. I get really upset in seeing the wrong things happening and want to do something to help, but often unable. How should I deal with this emotion? And uh, the way to deal with that is to understand that the world is inherently problematic. The world is a place of suffering and it's always going to be like that. It has always been like that. And it is no one's fault. It's the nature of the world. Remember one of the suttas we were talking about, the world or existence, it's founded on suffering. It is inherent to existence that there is suffering. And sometimes it looks like there is someone in someone, it is someone's fault. But actually, that's the wrong way to think about it. It's not really someone's fault because those other people, they are just acting out their habits, their defilements, their delusions. They don't really know what they're doing. And there's always going to be delusion like that in the world. So getting angry is not the answer. It is more to understand that the, that is kind of the, the sadness in the sense of the world, that it has to be this way. There is no way out. Or there is a way out, but that is through the spiritual path, not through trying to solve the worldly things. Yeah, and uh, so once you get your head around that, uh, once you start to have a bit more clarity about the nature of existence, uh, and once you start to understand it's no one's fault, it is just that people are blind and deluded and we cause so much suffering for each other, you can have compassion for everybody. You can have compassion for the victims. Uh, you can have compassion for the perpetrators. Uh, you can have compassion for the whole world uh, because you know we're all in this big mess together. Uh, and that is the right way of thinking about it. You can have compassion for Donald Trump, yeah? If you, I don't know if you like Donald Trump or you don't like him, but even some people don't like Donald Trump. So if you don't like him, if you think he's a strange leader, then compassion even for him, because he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't really understand, yeah? And then you can let go even of that. Okay, next one. Thank you, Ajahn, for the wonderful Sutta teaching. I find I have difficulty to let go of the senses and body during the death contemplation, how to be less attached to them. Uh, do more death contemplation, yeah? As you do the death contemplation, you will gradually uh, let go and you will be able to um, uh, kind of get to an end of these things. Just understand again the downside of the world, how the world is always unreliable and problematic. And the more you understand that, that world is exactly the world of the senses. Yeah, that is exactly what that world is. So as you do that, you will let go of that world of the senses. And that is how gradually it disappears. Dear Ajahn, an inspiration to see the great Bodhidharma monks. <laughs> okay, the best practicing monks in the world. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for these kind messages. Dear Ajahn, will the death contemplation make us indifferent to the current issues in our current world? e.g. pollution, war, abuse towards Mother Nature and, uh, and other human beings. And uh, I, I don't think so. I think what death contemplation will do rather, it will uh, uh, give you more clarity and it will make you more effective in how to live well and how to do the right things. Uh, so you, instead of, um, instead of uh, obsessively trying to sort out the problems in the world and then getting depressed and sad when you realize you can't do it because you can't do it. It's impossible to sort it all out. You can help, but you're never gonna be able to sort it all out. Instead of being obsessive and getting depressed, you put in your effort where you know it will be helpful, yeah? In other words, you're making good karma for yourself and you're making people happy in the world at the same time. That is what this is really about. 
So I think it will give you more balance in the way to uh, help the world. And that is really uh, the ideal thing uh, on how to do things. So. Um, dear Ajahn Brahmali, sincere gratitude to you for making the sutta so much easier to understand and for relating the suttas to current times we live in. I have struggled with it every time I look at the suttas, hence truly grateful to have you make it so much easier. Can I know if you do any regular similar sessions as I'd like to continue attending sessions like this by you? Um, yeah, we do these things a lot. Yeah, I, uh, I teach uh, retreats. I'm not sure where you are, but uh, I teach retreats in many places around the world, in the, certainly in Singapore and in Malaysia, obviously not so much over the past year because of the COVID situation. So, uh, but, uh, and we also teach online quite a lot. So if you keep your eyes and ear open, you will see where we teach these things. Uh, yeah, I, I teach regular retreats online. Uh, and so you just have to be, be with it. We also teach at our Damaloka Center in Nolamara here in Perth, and we do sutta readings every fortnight usually. Uh, we also had a workshop recently that you can look at. It's uh, online available, a workshop on uh, dependent origination that went over six weeks. We're going to do another workshop soon uh, on the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, which will be starting on the 20th of February, and it will be live streamed from our Damaloka Center here in Perth. Uh, and of course, you're very welcome to tune into that. It's open for everyone to take part and, and watch. Uh, so those are some of the ideas. But always when I teach retreats, I always use the suttas as the foundation. Uh, Dear Ajahn Brahmali, your sort of teaching have been clear and inspirational. Thank you so much. I will just read a couple of more uh, questions and then we will have a short break and then we'll do the last meditation afterwards. So. Uh, dear Ajahn, thank you so much for the wonderful sutta teachings and the guided meditation. The sutta explanation, as always, was very clear and interesting. Looking forward to see you in Melbourne. <laughs> okay, so uh, marvelous. May the year 2021 bring you good health, happiness, and peace of mind. Enjoy that. Uh, Sutta reading is much clearer with your explanation. Thank you, Ajahn Mali, for your time during the retreat. Uh, dear Ajahn, how to overcome the fear of the unknown in meditation? Uh, the way to overcome the fear of the unknown is to focus on the positive experiences in meditation, to see how happy it is, how peaceful it is, and focusing on that and not focus on, on so much on anything that may seem fearful. Uh, it is unknown, but you know, so many people have practiced this before you. And what they all say is if you get it right, you practice in the right way, meditation only brings two things, peace and bliss. Peace and bliss in abundant quality quantities. That is what it is all about. So, um, um, if you find that your mind is a little bit unbalanced, if you find that your mind does not, is not clear, if you're getting upset or you're getting deluded or you're getting confused, then you are on the wrong track. Then don't carry on. Yeah? Then ask yourself what you're doing wrong. Yeah? And then come back to the beginning again. Work more on your precepts until you actually start to enjoy the meditation and your mind is clear. The mind is not confused, uh, and you don't have too many defilements going in your mind. Uh, um, uh, merit is hard for thieves to steal. Can it be shared? If yes, how does it work? Yeah. So how, how can merit be shared? And uh, uh, the answer is that you're not really so much sharing merit. It's actually the wrong kind of word for this. What you are doing is that you are allowing somebody else to rejoice in the merit that you are making. Yes, you say to someone, I do this on your behalf. And if they are around, say that they are a ghost and they are around somewhere still, they may hear you say that and they may feel, wow, thank you so much for sharing the merit with me. Wow, that makes me feel so much better. What a wonderful thing it is. And in that sense, we are sharing, we are offering someone our generosity. We're being kind to somebody, and then hopefully they can feel that kindness. That's really what it is about. Okay, one last question. Uh, dear Ajahn, thanks a lot for the great Sutta teachings. 
What if a person starts to pass out air while meditating in a group retreat, which will cause discomfort to the yogis? Will it mean he is disrupting others from achieving mindfulness and jhana? <laughs> okay, um, I, you, you know, what can you do? Sometimes that's what, that's what the body does. So sometimes you just have to go with the flow and you can't uh, force these things. You can't, uh, you know, stop these things. So you just have to, um, you know, do what you do and then other people will have to deal with that i suppose in their way yeah it's just impossible to uh, control some of these things so just go with the flow do natural and if it gets too bad then maybe get up or something but uh, don't don't worry too much about it if people are getting close to jhana they won't be too much worried about these things anyway they will be able to deal with it uh, and okay so you are from singapore you're the one who asked before how to uh, see more suttas so Basically, I come to Singapore quite regularly, once or twice a year. Uh, we often do retreats. Usually, it is I'm uh, in, invited by the Buddhist Fellowship to so see what the Buddhist Fellowship is doing. I will be doing some teachings online for them, also for the Vesak uh, uh, season. So maybe I will see you. Uh, see you then. Yeah, you're very welcome to uh, be part of that, of course. So. There's heaps of more messages, but I'm afraid I will have to stop there. Uh, it would be nice to end up with a little bit of meditation. Uh, before we do that, let's have a five minute break and then we'll see you back again in five minutes. Sir.